All right, we're going to get started. My, uh, my goal for tonight is to get everyone in and out of here on time. We've said 6.30 to 8 is the time that we'll need. It's important that we kind of keep moving through the process. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Scott Green, Superintendent for Salina Area Schools, and I really appreciate all of you coming tonight as we kind of reconvene. We were here back in, uh, back in November talking about this process, and if you remember, we kind of led in with uh, Sir Ken Robinson video talking about the opportunities that are presented to Salina Area Schools if we really think long and hard as a community about what we want Salina Area Schools to look like moving forward and, and kind of develop a roadmap for that. And so tonight is a check-in point. We're not done yet. I know a lot of you have spent a lot of time over the winter working on this uh, these documents, working on these goals and action steps. There's still a fair amount of work yet to be done, but it's time for us to, to get together, look at some alignment issues, um, go over that, and begin to get feedback from beyond this group. So um, tonight is the start of that process, and then we'll move on from there, and I'll explain kind of our next steps as we roll through to April 23rd. Um, one thing to note, we are being filmed. We're going to be showing the first portion of this uh, on our website so that uh, community members can take a look at what we've talked about so far and then have a chance to kind of react and respond to the, to the uh, goal areas that we've already addressed and, and get feedback from them. So our steps for tonight, we'll, we'll open up each of the goal groups, uh, the goal champion and uh, one of the members of the committee will get up and really go through their initial goals and touch on the, the, uh, the components of the document you have in front of us. We're gonna break up into probably at this point five groups. Um, not your goal groups. What we're going to want to do is get a group um, that's a group of representatives from each of the different goal areas to sit together and then go back over those groups. And, and we have a process um, that we define. You'll get a, a sheet. We're going to look for some alignment relative to our, our mission and vision. And again, that information will be there. We're going to look at um, how the goals meet our needs, uh, whether or not these goal action steps serve our goals and our mission, and then ultimately have we identified the people's systems in place and then resources. As it relates to resources, I'll touch on that here at the end before we kick off. That's the next component that we really want to start to, to dive into. I know several of the groups have begun doing some research associated with that, really to determine when we talk about the things that we've articulated in these goal areas and these action steps, many of them come with either a price tag from a financial standpoint or maybe a reprioritization of, of our existing resources. So it's important for us to really look at that, but we want to get feedback on it before we get too deep into that process. After that small group discussion, we'll capture that feedback, and again, we'll take that feedback and integrate it into the, the documents as we move forward. We're going to have a process to get other for further community review and feedback. There are a couple other opportunities and meetings that we'll be at over the next couple of weeks to begin roll out and talk about this, this document that we have today, this draft document and ultimately incorporate into it some of the resource reporting that we're getting and the research we're doing in terms of resources. And then ultimately it culminates on April 23rd. And that will be, a, a, in this room, a workshop session with our Board of Education for us as, as essentially the Strategic Framework Review Committee to really talk about what it is we've, we've done over the last several months and, and move forward and allow the Board to, one, have their voice. Um, they can kind of look at those recommendations and decide how we want to move from there. But again, this is a critical point for us from, as a district to really look at what we've been talking about and use your collective voice as we move forward. So on that note, I will turn it over to goal number one. And I'll let uh, Betty Rosenleacher come up, and I know she has a committee member. Good evening, everyone. I am Betty Rosenleacher, and this is Dina Schneider. And um, she was one of, as you can see, several committee members, and we had just a really um, great group of people that worked on it, from teachers to parents around the, and community members. So we were really grateful. It was a lot of work. Um, we went from, I think, having kind of two action steps that we were kind of given when we got started, and we're up to seven action steps. So we refined it. One, you know, one of the action steps we had was all day, every day kindergarten. Well, we're there. So we took that off. There was no need to do anything more with that. We're already doing that and implementing that. Um, one of the things that we did spend a bit of time on was revising our goal. Um, the goal was, it was good, but it was pretty basic. It was all students will be proficient in reading and writing by the end of grade three. But with the Common Core State Standards and defining that a little bit more. So our new goal is all students will meet or exceed the Common Core State Standards in reading, writing, and mathematics by the end of grade three in order to acquire the essential skills necessary to apply their knowledge. And we really wanted to focus on that application of knowledge. It's not just that they're learning two plus two is four, but what do we do when we have these skills and apply it? So we spent a lot of time and a lot of conversation, but what does that really mean? So, so when you think about that application piece, you'll understand where we came from 
when we talk about um, our seven action steps. Okay. All right, step one, develop a pre-K education program and community communication around pre-K education. Step two, a coherent core instruction in reading and writing. And action step number three, a coherent core instruction in mathematics. Number four, intervention and extension in literacy instruction. Number five, intervention and extension in mathematics instruction. Six, develop and strengthen the use of the four C's, communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking by students. And number seven, develop and strengthen technology integration throughout our curriculum and instruction. My first time with the microphone. Woo. <laughs> you did great. So really, when we, when we look at these action steps, the first one, we really want to start to target those students who aren't getting into our preschool programs. We felt that that was really important. We, we see a real disparity, especially at the early L Center, if a, with the students who've had preschool instruction and those students who come that haven't had that opportunity and that exposure to preschool. So working with Sue Finn, Pooh Corner Community Ed, Mr. Lotch, they're really going to develop a plan and a program to start to go out there and really find those students who don't have those opportunities and really working with the state with Great Start Preschool um, to capture students who otherwise may not have those opportunities. And we think that really is the foundation for everything that we're doing when we talk about students being proficient by the end of grade three in reading, writing, and mathematics. Um, core two, or step, action step two, core in reading and writing, it really is focused on alignment to the Common Core State Standards. We're doing a great job. We have Reader's Workshop, Writer's Workshop, but there's a lot of tweaking that needs to happen to align to those Common Core State Standards. So as you look through that timeline, you're going to really see the focus is on that alignment piece to the Common Core State Standards. And if we're doing that work really well, as we move on up through the grades all the way through high school, we should have a really nice tight alignment um, moving forward. And our third graders leaving us will be ready for whatever is ahead of them moving into the upper grades. In mathematics, it really is about continuing the, the course of everyday mathematics, but pulling in the, that Common Core, those pieces that are missing. Um, we have actually adopted the Common Core version of everyday math, but there's some refinement that needs to take place there. And so our focus for the next few years is really going to be on that refinement piece, making sure that all of those gaps that were in our current everyday math program are tackled and attacked because those um, smarter balanced assessments, those online performance kinds of assessments that our kids are going to be faced, we need to make sure that we're attacking that and that they're ready for that. It's going online in two years. Um, if you haven't seen what those smarter balanced assessments look like, you really need to take a look at it. They, they're not easy. There's some of those questions, and I, I was scratching my head. I was looking at a fourth grade question going, if I had to do this, could I accomplish this task? It, it's big work ahead of us, and we need to get our youngest students ready for it because they're going to be faced with this right on through high school from now on. Now on. So we're attacking at the, at the early elementary level. If you haven't heard about our early intervention program and our best fit program in reading, it's happening K-3 in all three buildings. It's really powerful. Our next steps are really to look at it for writing and, and mathematics. Um, reading was our target and has been our target for a number of years, but now we really need to say, what about those students who aren't getting it in writing? What about those students who aren't getting it in mathematics? So you can see how we're going to be looking at best fit and opportunities for intervention and extension for those students who are ready for something more. Um, you know, we're really good at targeting sometimes the kids who struggle, but we need to um, remember the kids along the continuum and what are we doing for those kids who need something more. Um, the four C's, if you haven't heard about the four C's, communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking, we're going to be looking for ways that that's already woven into what we do in our classrooms each and every day. That's that performance-based stuff that we're talking about. The use of technology in the classroom, the use of performance-based opportunities, even with our littlest kids. It may be more group-like in kindergarten and first grade, but getting that into our classroom so our kids are successful when they start thinking about not just doing something, but can they do it with anything else that they have to tackle? Can they apply it to all of those different areas? And then last but not least, it is a technological world. Um, talking with just one of my second grade teachers today, she's teaching the kids. She went to McCall and she was so excited and she comes back and she started talking about social media in our schools with young kids. And she started talking about, oh, I don't know, Facebook and, and 
she named two or three things in the te and the kids all said, well, what about FaceTime? What about Twitter? What about what? And they had a list this long. They're more ready for technology in our schools than we are. And we're talking, these were second graders. So how are we going to put a plan together that all of our students have equal access to technology? And it starts K-3 and then moves on through the system. So thanks, Scott. Goal two. Hello everyone, I'm Julie Helber, I'm the Saline High School principal and I have with me Tina Leventhal and Tina is a community member but also a parent of a first grader and has a four year old. Um, so it was really nice to have her on this committee because when we think of 21st century learning environments sometimes we think of that secondary level leading into college but we really wanted to be able to look at district wide needs in 21st century learning environments. Um, Action six and seven actually of goal one is a perfect segue into our goal, goal number two, which is all students will acquire oh, I guess I can. all students will acquire and apply essential skills to be continuous learners and productive citizens in an ever changing 21st century global society. Um, this goal is a difficult task to um, discuss in a group group setting, mostly because there are many things that we don't even know are going to be happy, happening in this 21st century global society. Um, technologies are changing all the time. Um, uh, students that are leaving the high school are, are finding work and workplace environments that are different than they were before. So things are, are changing all of the time. We had a large group of folks that helped us um, develop the action steps for the goal and the specifics for the goal and they're listed up here um, and several of them are in the room today so thank you very much for your help it was also a lot of work a lot of discussion um, a lot of uh, trying to find clarity around um, what we wanted to see in Celine area schools in terms of this particular goal we based um, much of the work around Tony, a book written by Tony Wagner, who outlines seven essential skills for 21st century learning, and that's in your packet. But similar to the four C's that uh, goal one referenced, critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration across networks, and leading by influence, agility and adaptability, initiative, entrepreneurship, effective oral and written communication, accessing and analyzing information and curiosity and imagination. And our group sat for a couple of sessions really and studied these particular essential skills and thought about how this would play out in Celine School. So I'm gonna let Tina take over and talk to you a little bit about um, action step one. Our first action step is to explore and develop our buildings as 21st century learning environments. So this is basically exactly what it says, it's the buildings, it's the physical characteristics of those classrooms. Are our buildings, are they ready for that 21st century learning, the project-based learning? Um, is the furniture movable? Is there natural lighting? Are the colors happy? Things like that. Um, obviously, a lot of that takes resources, and since we don't know what the future holds for the school district, uh, we were just kind of thinking out loud and hoping that these things can uh, come to fruition. But in addition to the physical characteristics, it's the technology. As was mentioned before and will be mentioned again, the, the times are changing. We, can't, we don't have to plug everything into the wall, but yet we need spaces for our students to plug in their iPad, charge them up, things like that. So it's really just designing those buildings, looking forward to the future. And one of the things that we've done at the high school and middle school is, is implemented that the BYOD, Bring Your Own Device initiative. And that's really at the very beginning of phases at the high school. It's been at the, at the middle school for a year. But um, continuing to develop that, we've, um, I know our network and infrastructure has been updated. And there are going to be many more things down the road to be able to develop our buildings as these 21st century learning environments. Action step number two is explore innovative instructional practices using technology. 
Uh, we had several folks from across the district attend the McCall Conference, which is a, a, a big technology conference in the state of Michigan, and thousands of people attend this conference, and there are just hundreds of sessions that you can choose from. And one of the reasons for sending people to this conference was really to start to look at instructional practices that center on the use of technology and technology integration in the educational environment. So. Um, this action step really centers on taking a look at some of these best practices in technology integration and integrating them into our school environment. So online learning, blended learning, a flipped classroom, etc. There are many different possibilities that we can take on by integrating um, technology that we, we don't even know are out there. And so developing a group that would really study this and try to stay on top of the needs in a 21st century learning environment is the focus of this action step. Another um, uh, point of context for this is we talked a lot about project-based learning, and you've probably heard a lot about project-based learning in the, in the community and in, in educational settings specifically. And it does sort of um, lend, this, lend itself to goal one's discussion about um, having kids become prepared to be able to um, not only know and understand, but to be able to apply what they learn. And so we had uh, lots of conversations in our group about project-based learning and some of that, uh, some of that, that instructional practice that's happening at the high school that we'd see, like to see that developed a little bit more um, at that level, but also at the other levels across the district so that we're not, not just um, uh, delivering information and students are understanding and memorizing factual material, but they also have the opportunity to apply it in creative ways. And so that became a big conversation that dealt with this explore innovational, innovative instructional practices using technology. And this is something that's just going to change constantly. So if we settle in on trying an instructional practice, it may change a year or two later because of the, just the, the rapid nature of, of changing. Our third action step is to review and implement higher order, in, higher order integrated science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, that will provide relevant experiences to emerging fields of study. And this is a little bit more detailed than action step two with the project-based learning. This is more specific to the STEM um, education. And we feel it's very important. That is, seems to be the way America is going. It's much more um, STEM STEM related. Uh, so we'd like to start with just basic um, professional development for teachers, trying to find some other STEM projects. It could be something that's an entire semester that's built around STEM, or maybe it's just a two-week special project that's done in the first grade level. Um, we would like to look into integrating STEM programs at all levels. Right now it tends to be more into the high school and the middle school, but start to get those kids early on interested in science and technology. And also, um, perhaps if resources allow to expand the project lead the way. I, had, as a parent, had never heard of it until I sat in on this committee. And I work, I'm a scientist, and that program would have been amazing when I was growing up. And I'm hoping by the time my first grader and my four-year-old get to the high school that it would be fully integrated, because it sounds like a wonderful program. So we would like to just incorporate more STEM projects into all levels. Action step number four is to broaden the cultural competencies of our students. Um, we do have, as part of this action step, to integrate world language into our elementary levels, which is something, as you know, is being worked on right now. Um, but also, we felt it was important in this sort of era of globalization and of world flattening that we make sure that our students understand different cultures and, and um, can experience what they might then experience once they graduate high school and go into the workplace. We know that um, our students aren't all just graduating and staying in the United States or working in jobs that are here in the United States, but that um, we're looking at this sort of leveling of communication amongst the, all, the, all the countries in the world. And so having this global competency we felt was very important. So um, we thought also about the opportunity for students to explore alternative means to accomplish the world language credits at the high school. 
So outside of the language, the languages that we offer, there might be other ways to accomplish those world language requirements there, um, so that there would be other opportunities for students in, in some of those areas like sign language or, or another type of um, language that we don't traditionally think of as those world languages. And then also to provide opportunities to explore world cultures socially and also in a business setting so that students um, uh, can experience other cultures and, and, and learn about how that relates to what we do here, um, we thought was very important as well. So those are our, our four action steps for goal number two. Thank you. Goal number three. Hi, my name is David Raft, the Saline Middle School principal. I always require more support, that's why I have three people. Um, our committee was a well-rounded group of people. Where's if committee people from goal three could just raise your hand or stand up a little bit? Let everybody get knowledge. Yeah, stand up. A little bit. Mr. Hall, there's quite a few here. They need to be recognized. They did a lot of work on this, and we do appreciate their help. Our goal was uh, strengthen family, school relationships, and continue to expand civic, business, higher education, and community partnerships that support improved student achievement. Um, I had a co-chair, co-champion, which was Laura Washington, a middle school uh, Spanish teacher for us, and then our community member, Mrs. Heft, is going to help present our action steps. Action step one was to collaborate with current parent, civic, business, and community organizations to support student success. So action step one basically talked about who we bring into our schools in order to help us and help the students be successful, and basically also what other people do for us, mainly businesses, the foundation, and how we can improve these programs. So both existing and how we make those better. For example, the foundation has done a wonderful job for us and so what can we do within the foundation in order to make things better? And so that was basically what, what action step one was. We do want to collect data and to improve and increase the impact of events because a lot of what we realize is that we do do a lot within the Saline area of schools, both business-wise and with the community, but we really don't know what the impact of these are. So if at some point we could get some data to say, okay, this is really helping us out, that would be a wonderful thing, and that's just one thing that we realized as a committee that, that is lacking is just some, some measurement and some support of, of what is happening. Um, building, relationship, building relationships with businesses and venues throughout the SAS community to involve community members in district-wide events was a big conversation that we had a lot. Um, it was really important that we realized who was financially supporting us, and not only financially, but also um, giving us other resources, obviously, besides finances, and then again, how can we improve on, on that? Thanks, Laura. Uh, just to let people know, we had five action steps when we began our committee. We have reduced one. Looks like we don't loan that to goal number one. Give you an extra action step. Yeah. Uh, our actions <laughs> communicate with district residents regularly about Salinary schools. One of the things that was clear from our committee meetings were was that we um, we reached the people we that are paying attention to us and that want to know what's going on in Saline Area Schools. However, we're trying to figure out how we can reach the entire Saline Area Schools district in which maybe uh, there's people that are we've recognized they're retired. I know, for example, I had a, a, a grandmother come in and speak with me about wanting to know about things that are going on in Saline Area Schools, and sometimes we're not able to reach people that are actually do not have students in the system. So that's one of the things we're going to look at surveying families and community to determine any and to determine the needs and try to meet some of those communication. We recently went to, uh, for example, Mr. Puffer, he sends out a weekly email that has a lot of the events that go on in Slinger schools. However, a lot of our stuff is repetitive. Uh, for, for example, if you're a parent and a snow day is minimal as a snow day, you may get three or four phone calls from an administrator. <laughs> I'm sure you enjoy that. However, we might want to look at trying to, to narrow that down just a little bit so that we actually uh, can communicate in a more effective manner. Um, and so again, this is we, we again looked at doing a lot more surveying and did get some. Some I know Scott has already reached out to a, uh, a group that might be able to help us with this initiative too. 
action step three, explore new partnerships and increase involvement in Saline area schools. And even though we've extended the walls of the classrooms to provide our students with those opportunities, whether it's a team or a club or classes, we wanted to continue to pursue that. And whether it's the new facility next to the middle school or our own city, and we did have representation from the city, and it was somewhat interesting to hear maybe some opportunities with them. So find new resources, plus find students to match with that. So continue to explore the opportunities for staff and students to participate in new venues. And then lastly, goal number four is to improve existing volunteer programs that support SAS. So again, we know that there is a lot of support for Saline Area Schools and for its students, but we want to know who, what is already there and how it can be improved. And so develop the possible mailing at the beginning of the year again. Determine how to bring people who are not, oh sorry, I mean, yeah, determine that people who are not directly related to the school and knows what's happening and then improve existing volunteer programs that support SAS. A way of doing this that we saw in, um, in action step two was creating a potential communication director. And again, we know that takes money and we know that takes resources saying that it could be a very potentially powerful position, someone who is able to communicate for all of us. So if we had one potential person that we could throw all of this to, it may make a lot of other lives easier um, as far as trying to get the communication out and streamlining it. And so again, that takes resources, that takes finances, but it is a position that we thought, um, after conversing for many times, that could be very beneficial to the district. Good evening. My name is Brad Beeson. I'm the principal at Pleasant Ridge Elementary, and I'm here representing uh, goal number four, as we like to call it, the Positive Environment Committee. Uh, I am up here. Here is the love. We are sharing the love and goal for this evening. Uh, Kurt Ellis is with us. He was our co-champion. Um, so Kurt did a, a ton of work on this. And Diane Gottner, she's an example of shared leadership this afternoon. Um, she's sharing some of these responsibilities as we uh, go through our process. Also, I'd like to recognize Christy Cundiff. She is with us. We've got strong support from goal four here tonight. Uh, Diane Fries worked with us on our committee um, as well. Um, Marie Schluter from the high school is with us. Steve Sartori uh, is with us. Rachel Porter is with us as well this evening. So um, really a diverse sampling of people from throughout the district, uh, community members, parents, all of that kind of thing. And we think that we're at a pretty good spot here uh, to make some action steps and some recommendations to the board on April 23rd. Um, a few philosophies to kind of guide our work that we did. We wanted to make sure that this talked about all. And for a lot of our stuff to this point was just this group gets this or this group of students gets this. We want to make sure that all employees benefit from some of the action steps that we're talking about. So not just teacher mentoring, but para-ed mentoring, uh, building and grounds mentoring, all of those kinds of things. That was important. That came through very clear in our work together. So the idea of all. The other one is shared. This was a shared responsibility, not me as building principal or Kurt Ellis or Scott Graydon uh, responsible for climate and culture and happiness, but all of us have to get involved. So that was one. And then I think this has already started over the last year or two, but kind of a redevelopment of trust. All of this that we're talking about really does take a lot of trust on all of our parts. So I think that just all of us being together in the different capacities that we are from, um, certainly began to develop that trust again. So those are some of our overarching themes. Um, our first action step, I'll handle a couple of them, Diane will handle a couple of them, and then Kurt will handle our last one. Um, improve diversity awareness, and that's a pretty big thing, especially as we move from just staff awareness to students and staff. That almost well, it did double and multiply our work, but we want to make sure that our students are benefiting from some of this strategic framework stuff as well. So we, we really had a student emphasis as well. 
some, some specific things in that area, uh, looking at some professional development, continuing our work through No Place for Hate and the uh, ADL, um, continuing opportunities uh, through uh, Neutral Zone, some Gayrilla uh, programming that has happened already, assist training that has happened for uh, suicide and, for, and students who are at risk in those areas, as well as the re-implementation of peer listening um, at the high school. That was really a nice time with what Julie was talking about in terms of uh, goal number two there, action step four, those cultural competencies. For us to have that kind of exchange, we really do need to understand that there's some commonness among all of us too. So we're going to talk more about that, but really looking at diversity awareness. Our second action step is just that continuous policy review that always goes on with the board level. Um, but looking at our policies and making sure that all of our uh, most at risk, some of our at risk populations are protected there. So looking at that one, you can see what our uh, continuous policy review is. Goal number three, Diana, talking a little bit about school and district wide wellness. Goal number three is improve district wide wellness. We felt it was important to uh, develop a wellness program, not only for our employees. Uh, possibly bringing in for professional development, uh, ways in which we can become healthy, uh, and not only, um, we felt not only the wellness of our well-being too, and we, we brought into example the School of Rock. It done, did wonders for our building, it did wonders for our district. Uh, an example of that, when we found out that tickets were being sold on Craigslist, it's an affirmation to say that, yeah, we, had, we were onto something here. <laughs> and that not only do we need a bigger venue, but we need to continue this. It brought everyone together. So um, that was one of the things that, that we looked at. Um, a weight loss program, possibly. Um, uh, physical fitness, bringing all this in um, to our school system, not only for us, but for our students uh, and everyone across the district. Our fourth uh, action step was district-wide leadership development. We don't want to always stand up here and have the superintendent and the, and the building principal always be the leader. I don't always want to stand up in front and lead. We need to share that leadership. And we talked a little bit about getting not all the way back to site-based uh, decision making, but certainly valuing our input from our staff um, at, at a higher level. Certainly I think that a lot of top-down decisions have happened over the last several years and we have so much talent in Celine and I don't really think that we've tapped into all of the talent even on our staffs. Um, so I'm always in for shared leadership. Diane, if she has an idea, stands up and talks about it and leads us through whatever group that we're talking about, whatever building, we want to kind of refocus on what are the opportunities not for just the select few leaders in Celine, but all of us and how can we all lead. It can be student driven, it can be staff driven, Who's going to lead in our next initiative? Who's going to lead in our next project? Um, we really timeline that out. Steve Sartori wrote this goal for us, and I think he did a nice job of really saying, <coughs> how do we then make it meaningful for us as well? Um, and how do we evaluate that? And there are some survey pieces tied in as well. So um, just looking at that leadership development, not just the, the few, but all and many. There's a lot of power in this room, and we want to tap into that. So um, district-wide leadership. Diane will talk a little bit about our mentoring program on action step number five. <laughs> Develop and implement a district-wide student and staff mentoring program. Uh, we talked quite a bit about this. There is a mentoring program for certified staff, but we also wanted to include non-certified staff and not just the curriculum. We want to make all staff members that are part of the Saline Area Schools community to be a part of the community. And that means welcoming them, welcoming them from the minute they walk in the door. This is where the lounge is. This is where you hang up your coat. Little things that we don't do for these people. Yes, we do go over the curriculum with them, but we also need them to be feel important part of the staff. And this is where the lounge is. This is what we do. Uh, just logistical things to make people feel welcome from the minute they step in the door. And that goes for all staff. Every person in there. Everyone should be made to feel important that they are a member of this community. So develop mentoring programs for all staff. Support staff, teachers, 
and beyond the first year of your employment. And look at mentoring, not from uh, mentor mentoring within your job classification. So if you mentor uh, like a, a certified staff member within that grade level, within that a resource room teacher taking on a resource room teacher, uh, a certified staff member within that grade level, uh, make sure that it's meaningful, make sure that it's helpful to that person. Um, implement with the students, continue to implement the crew and web and some of these other things that link peer mentoring for students. Develop um, connectedness with um, some of these peer listening groups at the high school and continue that. And that's about it. The last action step we had was kind of a, a carryover from the previous strategic framework, and that is the implementation of an advisory model. Um, in the past, Superintendent Graydon had an advisory group that he would meet with, and what we've done is we've taken that process and we've suggested some revision to that. We want to continue to allow Superintendent Graydon the opportunity to meet with building level staff on an annual basis. He's kind of in the middle of that right now. It's, it's a bit of a, a mid to three quarter of the year progress report that he gets from those individual building staffs during the lunch hours. Um, but in addition to that, we wanted to create opportunities for the three assistant superintendents to go have very similar conversations in each of the buildings and allow staff to have an opportunity to ask questions and, and obtain information about the initiatives that we each have going on in our different areas of responsibility. In addition to those, we wanted to create an opportunity to create a district-wide advisory council where we'd have representation from each of the buildings and have representation from each of the departments come in and meet with the central office staff to get a collective view of what's going on. It's great for the Harvest staff to meet with Mr. Graydon and, and the Pleasant Ridge staff to meet with Mr. Graydon, but oftentimes the buildings don't know what's happening in, in each other's spaces. So we wanted to create this opportunity for all the groups to get together, uh, send representation to us. The final piece to this is to gain and garner information from the students, the parents, and the community at large. Um, a couple of the other groups have referenced using uh, surveys more extensively than we have in the past. We are in the process of setting those up um, and have been working over the last month or so to bring some of that to fruition. But we want to create an opportunity for all citizens' voices to be heard. We tend to hear on either extreme uh, about how we're doing, but we want to make sure that all voices in the community have an opportunity to be heard so that when we look at these different initiatives that we've got going in the strategic framework, we have an opportunity to make annual assessments as to what necessary changes there are based on concrete feedback that we get from people. So that is essentially goal four in an, in an overview. Goal five. I'm Janice Warner, I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Finance, and this is John Waterman, who is a community member in our group. Um, we have a great representation of both staff and community members for Goal 5, and I'm really proud of the work that the group did. Um, our district goal is, district shall establish short-term financial stability and long-term solvency. That was the original goal, and we didn't see any need to change it. Um, we did have four meetings. The first two meetings, we spent a great deal of time just reviewing a lot of different information. We looked at the revenues and expenditures of public schools, what we can control and what we can't. We looked at about 12 years of historical financial data for the district. We looked at the enrollment study from Plant Moran that they did last year. And we looked at statewide comparisons of per pupil revenue and expenditures. Um, and I think it was pretty enlightening for everyone. The third and fourth meetings, we started to develop the general framework of the action steps that we wanted and then um, finalize those to encompass the ideas that we had discussed in our previous meetings. For me, joining this uh, segment was because the largest challenge we're facing right now is the cuts in our schools. And without financing and without the funding, we're gonna have a tough time continuing to grow. And I'm amazed about the district, how after all the hits we've taken, we're now pulling together, trying to figure out a way, how can we keep improving even though we have less? So that speaks volumes to our staff, our leadership, and our um, board. Uh, one of the biggest things I learned here was how limited 
um, we have, uh, our local input is with funding. The majority of our funding is coming from the state. And those fundings are, are determined and then they can switch really quickly. Where you may see a change in the base for each student, but then you don't see the change in the retirement funding. And both of those can be devastating to the school. And I thought I had a handle on it before we hit the meeting, and then afterwards I, I felt really sorry for Janice trying to figure out how you were going to get these budgets. <coughs> okay, so we came up with uh, five different action steps. The first action step was develop a five-year financial <coughs> forecasting plan. Um, I think it's really obvious in these times of decreasing revenues that we really need to look at how um, our decisions of today are going to affect us one year, two year, five years down the line. They do have financial impact that, that's longer than just one year. So a five year plan is very necessary at this point. It will include replacement and maintenance and renovation schedules for all of our assets. And that includes our buildings, our equipment, our buses, and so on. Um, also, we are going to be transitioning to a new financial software next year. And this software will give us a much greater capacity of reporting and doing project costing across years, um, tracking our fixed assets within the system instead of on pieces of paper. And so as we set up this system, it's really important that we set it up properly so that we can um, take advantage of the full capacity of that software. One of the challenges with this was <clears throat> Every year this is going to have to change. This forecast, which I thought would be stagnant because we know about how much money we're getting for the student, actually is just going to change whenever the state gives their funding out there. So having all the costs in place and realizing what we're going to cut and then what we're going to try to push off into the sunset will make a big difference in how we're funding things. Um, goals two and three are really the same goal, just opposite sides of the coin. Um, it is to continue to investigate ways to reduce expenditures and continue to investigate ways to increase revenues while maintaining the core mission and values of Sleen Area Schools. Um, the district has been cutting expenditures for several years and trying to increase revenues for several years. And throughout that, we've tried to engage the community through long-range planning, through community conversations, and so on. But we kind of like to take it to a new level and develop a consultative group of community and staff <coughs> members that can help us brainstorm ideas for both cutting expenditures and raising revenue, bring in their perspective and their ideas. And these groups would um, report out to central administration on at least an annual basis. Um, some of the ideas that were discussed at the meeting were energy efficiency programs, recycling, shared services, enrichment programs, and maybe summer learning opportunities that would be open to other districts as a revenue producing idea. Additionally, the finance office um, should be reviewing any new or changed programs to make sure that they're financially feasible. And from hearing all the other goals, it sounds like there's a lot of them. Um, so that would be fun. And then we also want to strengthen the fundraising partnerships that we currently have and assist in coordination of efforts. So hopefully that will help them maximize the revenues that they can bring in. The discussion was what we really have control over. Bringing in cost-cutting uh, bringing in cost-cutting ideas is really a small piece of what our costs are. And it's like almost someone losing a job. If you just cut down your cable bill, that's not going to save the system. If we have a huge change, it needs to be a systemic change in funding. And that's what we've been facing. Our teachers have taken a cut. We've done some different things. Uh, we were looking at the increasing of funding, and we are looking at different ways. What really struck me was, every time we have a vote for millage or for anything, that's really the only time we as a local group have a chance to support our schools and make a determination of what we feel our schools are worth. So every time we go to the ballot is a time we have a choice of saying, Celine's schools are worth more than what we are giving, and we believe they're great schools. Action step number four was to return the fund balance to 5% and work towards 10%. Um, besides preparing annual budgets that hopefully have a structural surplus every year, we would like to see unbudgeted one-time monies go strictly to building that fund balance. Um, 
similar to what we did this year, we sold the land at the corner of Woodland and Maple, and that profit went straight to fund balance. We did not build it into our general fund um, budget. Budgeting for our nonprofit, when I look at the fund balances, and if I was running on a 5% fund balance, I'd be scared. That's rent living paycheck to paycheck, and we want to get back to that. Um, it, many times individuals see this fund balance as a way to offset you know, losses. It isn't an offset of loss. It's what keeps the system going. And if we don't have these balances, we're going to be falling behind on payments. <coughs> more, we're going to be a district that has a, uh, a greater risk. Our, rent, our uh, interest rates will be higher. So we do need to get back our fund balance. Our final action step was to develop and implement a financial reporting strategy to increase financial literacy and engagement. Over the years, we've had sporadic reporting out of our finances, um, you know, through the community conversations and in different blogs and things. But we really need to develop a comprehensive plan to share our financial data. And through that, we would like to have another co consultative group that would help us develop that plan develop what kind of information needs to be shared, and they would also assist us in, in um, distributing that information out to the community through their contacts. This is so important. When I came on the committee, I thought I had it figured out before we came here, and the stuff I learned about how little local control we have for the funding, we need to be sharing this information so we can control what we can control locally, and then we can push and get help for other sources to try to increase our, uh, our, our bottom line of the agency. Let's go five. We're done. <coughs> All right, now, now comes the, the fun part. You kind of have an overview now of, of where each group went with, in relative to their action steps and some of the more um, the in-depth. And so I want to touch base again and go over one more time before we break up into groups the, the next process. And I'm going to ask that the goal champions break up and, and go in, in each area. And again, I'm going to ask that you look to identify a group that maybe doesn't have many members of your own uh, original group. Because again, we want to have a cross-section of groups represented in each of the five areas. There are approximately 50 people here. So we're going to have five groups of around 10 individuals per group. And again, what I'm looking to have them do is to identify how, do, how does, does what we talked about, how does the documents that you have in your hand align to our vision and our mission. And we'll be handing out to each of you what exactly our vision and mission um, states, and so you can kind of look at it related to that. Also, do these goals then align not only to our, our vision and mission, but do they do they meet our needs? Where are some of the gaps? I, I made a couple of notes of things that I know I think we need to think about as we move forward, um, and how different goals need to relate to each other, uh, maybe a little bit stronger in, in order to accommodate some of the priorities and particularly some of the resource allocation needs. Um, do the action steps align to the goals? If you look at um, the, the major goal up top, do these action steps fundamentally align to that and are there gaps associated with, with those? Again, we want to take a look at that. And then have we identified the people and the systems in place? If you look at um, particularly some of the measures, those systems, are those measures appropriate for what we're talking about? Are there other measures that we need to consider um, as it relates to the, to the action steps? And then ultimately, are the, are the people responsible? Are the individuals and groups responsible? Are they appropriately Place. If you have specific resource questions, it's important that they, we get captured tonight um, here because it's important for us as we've started to do some of the research. Again, I've already thought of a couple of other areas that we're going to need to conduct some further investigation so that we have specific and, and, and somewhat accurate estimates as we go towards um, reporting to the board so that we can really get a handle on what we're talking about when we look at some of these areas. If you look at the, the document that comes out, it will have an area for you to, to, to fill that out. I'm going to ask that, that you can do this as an individual. I'd like to have some conversation going if the goal uh, champions can kind of facilitate that conversation in each of those areas and get through. Some of you may not feel comfortable filling all that information out. If you want to take that and email myself or, or your specific goal champion, feel free. And then ultimately, this will go. Um, this, these documents and this video will go up on our website. It will have an associated Google form, not unlike the document here. So, if you also have an opportunity to talk to your to um, other people in your community, other uh, community residents, to make sure they have an opportunity, if they can take about a half hour of their time, listen to this, go over the document, and then just give us their feedback. It's an important opportunity for them to contribute uh, to this process. Any questions before we move on to the next group? All right.
This has been an SCTN production.